go. Hey guys, it's me, Marina Maladin and Summer Lyons. Today on our guest is somebody amazing. So first of all, welcome to the Girls Talk. We have Branko Todorovic with us, and I am very, very excited to introduce to you my friend, um, Branko, how are you? Doing great, so good to see you again. It's been a while yes. since the last time I'm we saw so each other. I'm so happy you made the time to come and have this conversation, interview with us, because I know you're a very, very busy man. You have like 500 jobs, and you're all over. <laughs> So, hey, my um, pleasure, my pleasure. Uh, Thank you so much for inviting me. Sure. Um, so, how old are you? I just turned 40 very recently. You are? A few months no, ago. Look, I just wanted to I comment. Am. This is oh, all fitness. Thank you. So, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? Well, I'm originally from Serbia, but I've been in the U.S. about half of my life. I went to school here. Uh, currently... Because of my work, I'm in New York, been here for past four years, and looks like this year I will finish here, and then after that, we'll see, we'll see where the next job takes me. Okay, so when you, when you came from Serbia, where did you stay first? I went to school in Idaho, so I lived in Idaho for a period of years. I lived in Salt Lake City, I lived in Vegas, I uh, lived many different places before I, before I came here, but you know, oh, it's, wow. it's New York, but work only there are a lot of many okay better so do you like new york uh, yes and no so for work purposes yes but then everything else uh as you could heard we had to delay this for a little bit for all the firefighters and all the sirens to go away so you know from that aspect there are better places i would say how are the people uh let's say different <laughs> i don't, <laughs> don't want to yeah i don't i don't want to offend anyone different uh, definitely, you know, big city vibe and New Yorkers are, you know, special in their own kind of way. Uh, but let's say I, there are some other places in U.S., if you want to say, where people are a little friendlier and where it's a little bit more warm. Um, yeah, but if you want to build a career and you want a business, New York is the spot. You know what I think? So especially in our line of work, um, regardless if you're, you know, a competitor, if you're trying to go pro, if you're a pro athlete, if you're fighting for a... Uh, any type of endorsement if you're on a training side if you're just in on in the fitness industry this is a place to be i mean definitely i can tell you uh, la is is miles behind uh i mean anything that comes even closer i mean new york is the place to be even though maybe it doesn't seem like it because not a lot of competitors come directly from here right. but if you look at the fitness scene in general um definitely this is the capital Absolutely. okay so i understand that you are three times world champion in WFF pro beach body model is that true that is true so oh I compete as a as a NABA and WFF pro as as you probably know NABA being the original federation the first one which is celebrated about 100 years uh, since the first bodybuilding competition in England so everything branched from NABA uh, problem with NABA in the US is that it's you know of course so I MPC and IBB pro dominated that not much is known, but for example, Arnold, Frank Zane, Lou Ferrigno, Bill Pearl, they were all NABA champions, NABA Universe champions before they came to US. And most recently, for example, Flex Lewis uh, was with us for a number of years before he turned pro and came to California and came to train here. So a lot of European, Australian, South African, Asian athletes uh, come from pro and once they have won everything, there, you know, obviously everyone's dream is, is to come and co compete at the Olympia. Okay. So that's kind of like a natural path right now uh, where this okay. is going. So uh, tell me a, a little bit about your federation. I know the answer, but I was wondering for you to tell our viewers, can you go to Olympia uh, in NABA? And if not, what is the biggest uh, title in the federation? Well, problem with, problem with, it's exactly what you mentioned now. Problem is that we cannot go to the Olympia. There were some talks where, uh, I, I know because I know the president of WFF personally, where um, there were some talks between different federations. Because let, let's face it, there are a lot of great athletes in WBFF, Paul Dillette's federation from, from Canada. There are all the great athletes in NABA, in WFF, a lot of great, for example, girls in PCA here in US and worldwide. So there were some talks that some special invitations would be awarded for top athletes in other federations. Problem is that IFBB and Olympia would not award any judging seats. 
and you know that creates a controversy right away so for example if you have 24 girls in the lineup and four come from somewhere else well doesn't that mean that proportional number of judging seats should be awarded as well so I, I i'll tell you i competed in china in a first ever hybrid competition that was ibb pro and nava pro wow. uh, actually it was when covid was already on we just didn't know <laughs> so we're so lucky to come back a lot and that was a complete disaster as a matter of fact, competition stopped because the Chinese IFBB and Chinese NABA literally pick a fight where police had to separate them, and so that didn't get anywhere. So, so they're just telling you, yeah, they're just it's telling you that, I, I, yeah, I, I think we're still years away from anything, um, anything realistic, but unfortunately, I can never go to Olympia, which doesn't mean that I cannot uh, do that with, uh, with some of the athletes that I'm working with. I know. That's awesome. Summer, are you, are you, did you ever meet Branco in a gym or anywhere else in New York? No, not yet. So his gym is kind of close to my office. So my off, I don't know if I told you this, my office is in Fidei, but we've only started coming in on Thursdays and that was what, like two Thursdays ago. Um, and that day it was just, I had so many calls back to back and then we had like a team building thing after work and by that time I, there was just no way i was going to fit the gym in so this past week nobody went in so um we will be back i just don't know when well don't don't be a stranger if it's work or not i mean we're always here uh always training of course every day regardless what of gym is it so uh may, the gym where i train it's probably the last mecca in a city where anyone really serious um, about this sport goes. It's complete body on 19th Street between yeah. 5th and 6th Avenue. Um, everything else is, in my opinion, you know, it's a com commercial spaces like Equinox, New York Sports Clubs, Time, uh, Lifetime Fitnesses, you know, mm -hmm. with all due respect, they're there, it's a business, they're there to make money, but not necessarily places for us for, if you want to call it real training and a real prep. Right. Okay, okay so let's I go back to what you said. You said that you prepped a few athletes to the Olympia. Well, yeah, last year, as you know, it's, it's the day when we met, when, uh, when one of my athletes qualified, which was a huge day because I'm not, I don't, I don't have a team. I don't have um, many, like, you know, traditional coach will have, I don't know, 20, 30, 40, 50 people, depending on the size. Um, I focus on one uh, with some, you know, I might, I might share some strategies or, or come in a little bit as a consultant. I love to work with trainers. I love to work with coaches. Um, I think I'm more like a value added. I'm not a prep coach, but as you know, my training focuses on, on precision. I train single compound for the most part. So if there's detail to be added, if you want to call it, if, if there's a finesse to be added to the physique, I come in there. So in an ideal world, I would work with a prep coach. And I love, as you know, working one-on-one, -on -one, even though in some cases, you know, videos can be sent, but you know, I really truly believe in one-on-one, -on -one, in precision, and just watching that every rep um, being done and everything to the last detail as much as possible. So you do have a few bikini girls that you train right now for the current season. Do you mind sharing? So yes, <laughs> um, right now I'm working with uh, Marie Blanchard. Um, she's here in New York. Um, hold on, her name on uh, Instagram is Haitian Beauty. I'm sure you know her, Summer. I looked her up. Yeah, I sure did. She yeah, gorgeous. gorgeous. Yeah, so, yeah, so tell us a little bit of a, Marie took a little bit of a break. She she competed in 2019. Was in the first call out of the Arnold in 2019. Uh, I believe she finished fourth. So she was pretty close to that pro card. But then you know after that got married and you know that first first year of honeymooning and but now she's she's ready to get back. So we are six week from Pittsburgh Pro, which I think it would be a good place for her to be seen again after almost two years. Um, Hold on, she's a pro that, or amateur? No, she's amateur. She never turned pro oh. in 2019. Like I said, she got close. Oh mm -hmm. my God, so I'm so going to meet her in one of the national shows. Uh, absolutely, you will meet her. We, we still haven't, to be honest with you, we still haven't picked the national show. It will just depend on, you know, which ones are on, which ones are in Florida. I mean, obviously, right now, uh, a lot of things are shifting, and we'll also see. But it's going to be something soon, because I, I think she's ready. 
and the big thing will be to turn pro as soon as possible so we can start building towards her first uh, pro show. Cool. Wow. Good luck to her. So uh, tell us a little oh, bit you. about your uh, training uh, philosophy because you, you, you have a very different way and a different approach. How do you develop somebody's body? So let's start with lifestyle and then talk about competitor because you do have some lifestyle clients. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, vast majority of my clients are lifestyle. Um, I work predominantly with women who are, if you want to call it middle age, who do not compete, who are just, just like you said, lifestyle, who are trying to stay fit and basically balance between their, you know, professional work, professional career, social life, and then of course, trying to stay fit and trying to stay healthy. So that's mainly um, where, where most of my business is. Um, however, I'm stepping away from training someone on a regular basis. So I have more and more people who are um, who I'm either, and we'll talk a little bit about my pat partnership with Techno Gym, who I either see through Techno Gym or who come to New York occasionally. But as I told you earlier, I prefer to work with trainers and um, so they can pass on and do day-to-day -day activities and day-to-day -day training with their clients. Um, it's awesome. just another way to scale my business as well because as you know, there's so many hours you can be on the floor and you know I've been on it for quite a few years so yeah. just trying to stay off my feet a little bit more and just be not necessarily it's not that I don't work hard but just to work a little bit smarter absolutely okay okay um, so as far as training philosophy is, 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 as you know um, you know my training is based on it's based on precision it's based on focus it's based on angling um, a lot of emphasis on tempo changes of tempo assignments so anything and all these things that are, I think, in today's training forgotten with giant sets, with hit training, uh, everything that has been forgotten. So basically just working on aesthetics. Um, I try to train myself that way for years. Uh, I steer away from multi-compounds, for example. Me, I've never deadlifted in my life. I mean, I know how to do it. I just do not do it in my training. And you see, my back is still fine. But I keep my waist under 30 inches on stage. Uh, and it's not much off even right now and I'm just I am 6'3 240 so you know I just don't believe in anything that will jeopardize the wait wait line. summer's I calculating any, uh, uh, I know I was like 6'3 <laughs> 240 like, is 30 inch yeah. waist okay, exactly how, how wide is your shoulders I don't know I haven't <laughs> measured but uh, <laughs> um, uh, I think they're well you never measured? No. I, I got to ask my tailor. I just got measured for a suit just recently. I'll ask him what the, what it was. Oh, okay. Um, well, you know anyway, the, the I, measurement I, I, of your waist, so I thought maybe you know the measurement of your uh, shoulders so uh, we can I know, get the perspective. Just because, just because I get for every show I have a custom-built shorts because I try to gift them to someone or do something with them. So I get those measurements done. Uh, Freak more frequently than than shoulders, for example. Okay. But tell you what, I got measured for a suit, so I'll uh, I don't know right now, but I would uh, I would tell you. So anyway, um, I believe in a in a complete beauty of a human body. Um, you know, I, I necessarily even for bikini, I had to. It, it just depends. You know, there is no one answer, as you know. Even in and I know probably we should talk a little bit more about bikini uh, here than other events, but there is no one look. And I think you've seen that over, over, the, over the years. For example, you know, two years ago, Isa with something completely different came and won the Olympia. Last year, it was, it was completely different, Absolutely. more feminine approach, more, more towards beauty, towards hair, towards makeup um, than anything else, where some girls that were, uh, you know, super conditioned uh, were not even looked in the first three, four call-outs. So, you know, that criteria changes. I don't think anyone really knows uh, it's much more structured in my federation, but in IBB Pro, it's, you know, you go from one panel to another. So, for example, we had experience where we went to Lake Tahoe, where they really wanted to see a, a softer look. Um, and then you go a week later to, for example, for, to Minnesota, and then they want to see something completely different. Yeah. Now, you know, different one panel judges? to another. Now, both, both, uh, both shows, Olympia qualifiers, so how do you possibly prepare an athlete in seven weeks time to go from one level of conditioning to another? So, so that's well, something. It's kind of like um, the one that won the Tahoe show was Casey Sumsel and she was way yeah. soft. Yeah. And but then that's... the next time 
we had uh, Gabriella. What I hear from a lot of podcasts that try to explain this phenomena is that they say that what looks best on the athlete. So if some athletes look good shredded, let them be shredded. So I'm thinking to myself, well, we all bring our best. So that means everybody's a winner. Yes. So so that's very, but, but in some general, well, talking with the head judge or with the panel, you would see that they were steering towards softer look, for example, which you mentioned in Lake Tahoe uh, versus much sharper um, somewhere else. So, so yeah, I, I agree with you hundred percent. I always, when I train someone, I envision their best look for their, for their frame, right? For their physique. Oh, yeah. And then we go from there because just like you said, not everyone needs to be shredded to the bone. And that's at the end, that's not what the bikini is about. Yeah. So we go, but some, some little closer guidelines should exist in my opinion, because it's very difficult to prep otherwise. Yeah. I, I just wish I knew exactly how we should train you know, and what judges would like to see, but you always go second guessing. You, you have know. to guess in bikini. Get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> this is I'll how try. it is. I think it's the only division. Like it's like that. Well, what do you think summer? But also too. So I will say this. So like some of my clients, when I'm prepping them for their shows, like they don't have enough muscle tissue for me to really, really, really bring them in hard. So there has to be that fine line of keeping that fullness to still look like they have muscle tissue versus sucking them down where they look like a, you know, pretty much a, a pencil, you know? So like <laughs> having, I mean, I'm just being honest, like, yeah, I mean, you have to have that muscle first as well, but obviously, you know, that comes with time and everything else, but you're right. So like for me, sometimes me coming in, if I, I look better when I am actually a little bit softer, but I'm fuller. I think I look best when I'm shredded, but everybody else tells me that I'm way too lean and I never place well if I'm way too lean. So again, it's just, yeah, it is definitely each individual person. And I guess with like the pro leagues as well, like they see them multiple times, time after time after time. So they know and they can compare each look to their prior showing. Yeah. Well, I never been too lean, so I don't know how that feels. <laughs> I can't get lean. Shut I'm up. always soft and round and true. soft. That is not. But true. this year, this year we're going for the lean look. Let's see how that looks. Oh, Jesus. I'll keep you updated. <laughs> Next question. Uh uh um. I want you to tell me a little bit how this love to fitness and how this love to bodybuilding and started. Do you have any background in sports? Did you just stumble on some magazine? How this all happened? No, I'm I really glad you asked me that because I was a runner actually my whole life. I started when I was, I don't know, 10 or 11. That's how I earned my scholarship in US. Um, and then after that, I had a career ending injury by the end of college where I, I knew, I mean, I can run now but nothing even close on that, that level. So, you know, I started you, with physical. Were you a long distance or short distance? I ran 400. 400. So I was a sprinter. Mm -hmm. Tough. So That's very, it, very anabolic. It, yeah, yeah, very. Um, so anyway, my daughter, was, my daughter was small, and I really tried to avoid surgery. And I remember talking with, uh, with a surgeon who said, hey, you can try some of these exercises. Uh, there, was a, there was a doctor with Seahawks that kind of, had some of the some of the ideas how to strengthen uh, spinal erectors around L3 and L4 and avoid that surgery because even surgery in my case is about 50 50. So I took about six months break and then slowly started doing some some of those exercises which were body weight. And then you know after a year I felt better. Um, they cleared me for weights, so I slowly started lifting some smaller weights. And then guess what? You know you start you join the gym and it wasn't too much later when you meet a couple guys that are competing it's like oh okay <laughs> you know maybe you should maybe you should think about it right and you know I started competing when I was 10 in, in running and track and field so of course you know I didn't feel like I was done I wanted to feel being an athlete again so a little bit by little bit there we go started um, started competing with them locally in Idaho and then that is very awesome. I, I hear that story again and again and again. Athletes that get injured or just, you know, finish their high school career and want to do something still, they turn to bodybuilding. For me, when I continue, stopped dancing, that was my outlet to get back 
in shape yeah. and get back on stage. Summer for you, it was basketball, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like it's like the best outlet to look good, still train and be fit without injuries. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, we're in a, one of the rare sports. You know, I'm 40 and I'm still competitive on our pro stage. But if you think about it, like in soccer, or basketball, you wouldn't have a chance. I mean, most of these guys by 30, they're done. So, so this is something we can we can continue doing. You know, those who choose until I mean, I, I have some friends who are in their 70s and still compete. So. Oh, wow, that is awesome. Yeah. So um, in WFF, did you choose that federation because that's what was available in your country? No, um, I was actually in U.S. Um, I just okay. had some, uh, let's call it differences with MPC and IVV. Um, and I, I just decided to go to a place where, uh, you know, I wouldn't have to deal with necessarily having a, a, a coach or a prep coach or someone else to get where I wanted to go. I, you know, just simply where I disagree. Um, you know, I support all athletes because this is about athletes. It should never be about a federation or a federation officials. So, you know, I support all athletes. To me, it doesn't matter if someone's competing MPC or in my federation to, to work with them. But it was a personal choice. Uh, I feel great in NABA because I get to promote shows. I hold seminars. I'm going to South Africa next week to train their pros and hold a seminar yeah. there. So it, it's awesome. a little bit different. It's a little bit different uh, approach if you're going to be, you know, I got my contract with Techno Gym through them. So, you know, you, you can't just, you know, I can't say that this sport didn't bring me a lot. So, you know, why should I leave all that over? You know, I understand Olympia as something that, you know, I can never experience directly. I can never be on that stage. But then still, you know, this sport brought me a lot. You experienced it last year through your client. So that's amazing. Yeah. It, it is. And, and watching, watching, you know, my athlete last year being on Olympia stage was absolutely phenomenal. And, you know, I feel I felt the same. I feel like just like if I was there, as a matter of fact, I, I probably had <laughs> I was more nervous uh, than she was up there because, you know, that this is where my um, my uh, any work, type of your work is sh shining through. Yeah. Yeah. It is, you were saying you something, Summer? <laughs> Summer oh. just listening. <laughs> she's no, whatever, she's happy to <laughs> say something. Uh, maybe ask him about how you become pro. Hey, I have questions. You guys are talking. Oh, oh okay. I thought, I thought I'm, I'm hoarding the screen. Sorry. Okay. A um, few more questions and I'll be done. So um, you, uh, you turn pro when? I turn and how pro do you turn pro in your federation? I turned pro in 2017. It's very similar like in MPC, except here are national level shows in uh, WFF and NAB, it's international. So you have to win European title, world title, universe title to get there. Now there are a few either bigger shows that are not necessarily for title that bring pro cards. Uh, I won my pro card at the world championships in Cyprus in 2017. Wow. You and travel I a lot. I do. Uh, and I switched events because there is no classic in NABA. So there is beach model, which is more equivalent to physique. And then there's pure bodybuilding. So we don't have it really anything in between. So when I was, you know, I had to make a decision because I was in between. You know, I was classic guy and I had to make a decision. And I, and I just thought that, well, a lot of people ask me why I don't do it. But because there is nowhere to compete. And plus, I'm much lighter than... Um, than MPC or IVB Pro guys. So um, that's why I chose to go a little bit lighter and smaller. Uh, in all honesty, it helps my work. Uh, I'm much more aesthetically pleasing. And, you know, being 6'3", I would probably have to be closer to 300 pounds to even be something and try to compete as a pro bodybuilder. I mean, on, on the highest level. And, you know, even at 250, I start not feeling as good. So... You know, I always say, if if God gave you bikini body, don't try to be figure, you know, and vice versa. <laughs> you know, and awesome. we all have so, to, you know. what is the criteria in in uh, WFF that is different than bodybuilding? Because you mentioned that the way they judge in NPC, it's different than the way they judge in WFF. So, what's the differences? Uh, Let's, well, for example, in bikini. If you want to cover bikini first, yeah, great. Um, bikini is completely opposite than MPC. So they go much for a softer look. Um, outline of the abs can, abdominal wall can show, but nothing more than that. Shoulders cannot be capped. 
So it's very, very difficult. A lot of these girls don't even lift weights. You know, they'll work on some type of, you know, hit workout or they'll, they'll, they'll do classes and stuff like that. But they look, it's much more um, fitness model look, kind of like a model that we hire at Techno Gym to do work. What about the glutes? Uh, glute, you know, glutes are tight, but not as tight as, not as tight as bikini, you know, nowhere even near. So just, if you can think about the most balanced way to show it. So kind of like bikini was in 2006 or seven when it started. Yeah, that, that's safe to say, yes. Okay, and do you have a category above that? Yeah, so we have a lot of, so you see, when NABA started, NABA is like a hardcore bodybuilding federation, right? So all these guys started in England. So all these like blue collar hardcore guys in Birmingham, I was there several times when you see them, those workouts start at 4 a.m. They lift heavy, they don't mess around. You know, they're just really hardcore competitors. And idea was that NAPA only stays bodybuilding and all these other categories, what they call modeling categories, they form another federation, which is WFF. So we have multiple, we have sports model, we have beach model, we have wellness. So there's a lot of these modeling categories and then bodybuilding in WFF is what's kind of like um, classic in IVB Pro. And then NABA holds bodybuilding only, like big guys, you know, like, like unlimited bodybuilding, if you want to call it. Uh, judging criteria are completely different. Um, I'm an international judge. I actually judge uh, a show back home that I Oh, you a judge too? Oh, that's yes, amazing. I'm a judge too. Uh, I, I try to avoid it because I know so many people now uh, and it's really difficult. So, for example, if you and I work together and you're going to be on that stage, I can't judge you because it's just not fair. But then if I know Summer as well, and then she's going to be there too. I mean, that's clearly to me <laughs> a non, uh, you know, uh, uh, there, there are some issues there. And, you know, I just don't like to be, um, I don't like to be caught up. You want to be objective. Well, I want to be objective. Yeah, Absolutely. I want it to be fair. Um, I don't care who is there. I, I, I respect and love everyone and, and would never love to judge a friend versus someone that maybe I don't know, if that makes sense. So if it's someone I have a personal relationship with, I would just sit out on that one. Okay. So, um, so you, you were saying that when you were a judge, that was way long time ago before you got involved and got to know a lot of people in the industry. No, I, st I still judge. You still um, judge, I, but I far away, judge. maybe? Uh, sorry? You judge like far away countries, maybe? So you don't know yeah, nobody? So, so, or you so just step have, out? No, no, no. We, we have a show in my country that awards six pro cards. And that's typically in May. Now it's been, it looks like this year will be canceled again because of COVID. But over there, it's very difficult because I know them all. So I, I think from this year on, I'll probably completely move on doing something else. Because, you know, I don't want to be unethical. I don't want, you know, I, I just don't do some things that I see here. Oh, uh, For example, I'm going to judge you, but then come and have a posing session with me. I don't do that. Right. Um, you know, I, I try to make it fair, objective as much as, as, much as possible. And when that I see, awesome. for, for example, I saw judges because being a head judge, I can see everyone else on a tablet, but they can't see mine. So you would see judges from the same country, you know, awarding maximum amount of points to their competitor as soon as they step on the stage. Uh, I had a, it happened to me once, a judge from Turkey, Turkish girl comes out in bikini, she gives her 10 points. I sit her out and said, you're out, because that's just not what we do. Oh, so you even, you even, um, you give points differently too. Because in, in, in uh, NPC, you need to get the least amount of points. So yeah. if you give 10 in WFF, that's the most yeah. amount of points. That's it's, the best. It's, okay. it's, it's completely, it's not uh, it's it's the least amount of points. Yeah, it's, it's the most. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so, so, um, but, but anyway, just trying to stay objective, trying to stay ethical, you know, it, it's super great. important to me. And that's why, you know, I'm invited to judge. I'm invited to promote shows just because everyone knows um, that I would never give a countryman or, or a, you know, a girlfriend or a friend or an athlete. There is no, if you're on that stage and I'm judging, I'm going to judge you 100% right. Absolutely. Cool. Tell us a little bit about Techno Gym because I understand that you work with them and that's a very interesting job. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's super interesting. It really got me to some uh, um, interesting people. Um, so I started collaboration with them a couple of years ago. Um, started doing some... 
um, trade shows, events, if you want to call it. And then more and more, I got interested in the equipment because it's completely different than, uh, than anything else out there. Uh, I'm talking about not equipment that you see in clubs, but equipment that it's, that it's for, um, for personal use, for home gyms. So um, soon I realized that they don't have much content, so we started collaborating on that end. So now I write content for them. Um, I write content privately for some of their best clients. Um, so yeah, I, I support them. So it, it's, it's a great job because you know I have my own hours uh, and that name means a lot, a lot um, in business just because I told you earlier where majority of my personal training clients are and you know, technology being best of the best. Um, no, no comparison with, with all the respect with Cybex and lifetimes of the world. Um, so anyway, it opened a lot of doors for me. So that was, that was a, one of the main things why I'm even in New York, because I really couldn't say no to something like that. I saw on your Instagram that you trained some different kind of Olympic athletes too. Yeah. So, um, last year I was especially involved with equestrian. Um, Ken Farrington being one of them, Ken won silver in, um, in Rio, and he's one of the favorites to win gold in Tokyo in equestrian. So, um, in what? I, in equestrian, so you know, jumping over hurdles with a horse. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so he's an Olympic rider. So I developed um, on Technogym Kinesis on one of the pieces that it's a closed loop cable system. I developed the entire uh, equestrian content and some stuff personally for him. Um, for Georgina Bloomberg, for so so for many athletes uh, on that side. So yeah, we do a lot of a lot of different things. One machine, but then applications for I don't know tennis, football, golf, equestrian, uh, bodybuilding, uh, just overall fitness, any type of hit move, uh, functional hit movement. So so really um, something where I take a lot of pride in, and it it really just like you pointed out gets me to some some pretty cool and unique people. That is amazing. Well, I finished all my questions and my Instagram questions. So, <laughs> Summer. Oh. Well, I guess mine, I mean, mine would be more so directed towards like people who would be watching this. So, you still have a lot of like lifestyle clients, right? You, that's what you were saying. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, that's probably a majority of who definitely would watch this. So, my question to you is. People who are in lifestyle, like who are your lifestyle clients who are trying to juggle, you know, being healthy, trying, having a full-time job, being a mother, you know, doing all the things like, what have you noticed about these women that you work with that allow them to be successful? Like what, what do they do? What's their demeanor like? Like, just tell me in like, what keeps them motivated? Just all in all, like, what do you, what do you see? Well, I, I think what keeps them motivated for, for the most part is us, um, us who, who provide content, who, who guide the work. Mm -hmm. um, most people like someone to hold them accountable, uh, but then also what keeps them motivated is results. Everyone likes to see them. So it, as we all here know, you know, processes, it's about consistency, it's about repetition, it takes time. We talked about this earlier, building muscle, or losing, um, but I think, you know, us keeping them accountable, being there as a support system, especially for the ladies, it's huge because not a lot of them have it at home. And, and that's a huge problem. You know, you have most of the time where, um, you know, there's no support because maybe that significant other does not want his spouse to look good. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of like a reverse, a reverse psychology type thing where, you know, maybe that person would like his wife to look good for him, but not necessarily for the rest of the world. Um, so so uh, I think more than training, more than diet, more than anything else, is that support that they can get the empowerment to start out with, because a lot of them, it's, it's very difficult to even step into the gym for the first time. So, you know, something very interesting that I want to share, I have noticed that I always make a, kind of like, if you want to call it like a, like a timeline, right. and on one end, put a girl, Instagram girl, that takes 27 selfies a day and posts everything. Okay, so obviously she feels super good about her body, right? And she wants to manifest it and wants to show it, which is great. But then the other side of the spectrum, put a woman that doesn't feel good about her body at all, does, would not take a picture if her life depended on it, right? So when I start with someone like that, I always like to find a happy middle for them. And, and it's very, and this doesn't fail because you can see, you know, after a period of time, 
they start wearing less clothes in a gym. You know, they're a little more and more confident. Absolutely. And then all of a sudden, I wait for that moment when there's that first picture. It says, would you take a photo of me or would you take a video of me doing this? That's a breakthrough Absolutely. to me as a trainer. For the first time, when I get asked by one of my female clients to take a video of them training, I know that we have made significant gains. I don't care how many pounds less is that. I don't care how it looks. I know that mentally we have, we have made a huge, huge, huge progress. And then from that point, it started rolling on. So, you know, you know, dress code is, is significantly different. Uh, there's more and more photos, more and more posting. Then all of a sudden, oh, this is where I was. So here's my transformation. Everything moves on. So I, I kind of have different parameters how I measure someone's progress. So it's not necessarily, oh, we lost so many pounds if, if it's a weight loss in question. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, with athletes, I look at movement. Uh, I can tell how my athlete is moving if they're getting fit, if they're getting more conditioned. Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily care about weight because I spend a lot of time under tension. So I would try to build uh, what you would like to build instead of using heavier weights to use the lighter ones. Again, to protect your waistline, to protect the, the overall aesthetics. Elongation is a huge part in training, but more than that, I look at, I look at you know, the, the, the emotional side and how strong that person is getting in their mind. Yeah, absolutely. Because once that's passed, everything else will come in play. Because, you know, let's face it, anyone can lose weight. It's very super simple. You know, just eat less, right? It, it's very, it's a very simple. Anyone can build muscle, but it's like, are they ready to do that? Are they truly ready? They can say, oh, you know, it's a new year resolution, but whatever. But are they truly ready? And, and to me, with, especially with ladies, I noticed that through, through picture taking. I know it might sound crazy, but trust me, it works. No, absolutely. And I mean, like, even in what I would say on this, just like women starting to take pictures of themselves, like they, when they're first starting off, they absolutely hate it but you just keep them taking pictures of themselves. And eventually, if you can get them over that hump of like the first couple of weeks or like the first six weeks and like get them to actually learn to enjoy the process, it will make them actually want to stick to it and it be something that's going to become part of their lives. Because for me, like that's kind of where I'm transitioning a lot of what I do with my clients too. And and that is usually the hardest part. You, anybody wants to start and then they'll end up, you know, quitting on you after a couple of months or something like that, just because it's one and done. And they think that it's going to, you know, it's going to stay off forever. They're going to look good forever or whatever, but like, it's a constant process. You always have to be working on yourself. And that comes from the mental aspect of actually wanting to continue to work on yourself. So like you're saying, like having that accountability and like getting them over that hump, like once they start seeing the changes, the momentum comes. And after mm -hmm. that, it's done. You know, they're sold from then on. Yes, to get I totally agree. The person that taught me how to post and take pictures and be confident, and I'm not lying, is Summer. Oh. Summer used to be my coach back in 2017, I think we started. Yeah. Yeah. 18. And I, I didn't post on Instagram much and I saw her posting and she really gave me that confidence as well to love myself as well to train hard. And, you know, so thank you, babe. You're welcome. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, I just kind of went off on my tangent. I didn't even, whatever. Sorry. Um, I don't know. No, I, I think it's a super valid point. I mean, I, I spend most of my days with women and I, and I see this. So it's, it's ultra super important. You know, also I see a lot of, especially if you want to talk about competitors, I see a lot of big guys, big pro bodybuilders managing, you know, bikini girls and training them the way they would train themselves and they would train males. I mean, let's face it, training a female versus male is completely different. I agree. Absolutely. You know, different muscle lines, different different approach, different different type of muscle being built underneath that skin. I mean, you cannot you cannot train five foot two bikini girl as you would you would train you know classic physique guys. Um, so so my training is completely different. What I do with myself, that's not how I train any of any of my ladies. Uh, but then also besides the different training, it's it's uh, you know because as you know, some people like to be um, you know babysit and be super gentle with 
yet alone some like to get a kicked in the ass every once in a while. But it's, I think it's our job to know exactly who is which way because sometimes that can be counterproductive. So we have to be really careful knowing um, what method works best for that particular client. So that's why, Marina, I don't, I work with one competitor at a time basically because I want to focus all of my energy and everything I have on one person because that's, as you know, that's a million questions about, you know, about everything. And not necessarily that relates to training, but just, personal life and everything else that is going on because you can develop any plan you want it's never going to be 100 percent as you know because life happens you know we have other things um than just uh, our careers and our competitions so just being there so you know i don't know maybe i'm not efficient or but i just focus on one person so do you train uh people differently off season and in prep or maybe for lifestyle do you train people differently when they're trying to lose weight or gain muscle? No, not necessarily. I mean, like, because you said you don't lift heavy. You work on detail. So is that something that changes along the time or the way? Uh, slightly. I mean, um, everyone, including every competitor, might not be necessarily ready right away to jump into um, under tension training immediately. Uh, and I can show you this. I can show you some exercises where it's, it's just a time of adjustment. So I don't necessarily think it's a different training. I just develop strategy that goes, um, that goes, um, I think, I, oh, okay, you're back there. Um, that goes along the way for the entire year. So I prefer to have my winter training as is, but I, I just, I personally, first of all, don't believe in there should be off season, on season body. I mean, as you know me, I fluctuate maybe five, six, eight pounds on 240. So when I see a bikini competitor fluctuating 30, I just, you know, <laughs> so um, I, I don't know. It's, it's just a little bit different um, because of my work. I always have to stay fit. I like it. Um, and then, but then other, other side is that, you know, I can't really grow too much. I'm a beach model, so I can't be 260. So I don't really need to go there. Uh, it's much easier. I just basically keep myself fit. As you know, I eat almost the same all year round. Uh, I might tighten it up. So your do nutrition cardio. don't change either? Not much. And I don't do cardio. Uh, very rarely. And I should be doing more. This is not advice I'm giving here <laughs> to everyone else. Uh, but I try to condition myself with the way I train and with my nutrition. So very, maybe like last two weeks, I'll do a little bit, a little bit of cardio here and there. Um, but that's yeah. about it. And, it. and it works. So, um, so you, you telling us that bikini girls should stay the same weight all the time. I don't no, think I can do that. Not I, I need way. my 15, 20 pounds. And it's I not because I'm lazy. It's just I feel like I want to get my uh, hormonal functions back. I want to grow some muscle. So I need to eat a little bit more. And I cannot always control how much fat I gain. Um, was what I, was well, I don't know. I, I, I would like gonna, to hear more about that. I was what do you think? Ask. I was going to ask. So obviously everybody has very much so different body types. So can you reset people's fat, I guess, fat storage, how much, or can you recomp someone's body to be closer to a stage lean weight? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's a very simple formula of, you know, what, what you're getting in. I personally, I don't eat very, very little fat every day. Uh, I live on 25, 30 grams of fat throughout the year. You know, my, but my you're body. A man. My, <laughs> but I need I'll my talk, fat. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about, I'll talk about, I'll talk about ladies here in a second too. But for example, I don't need it. My body responds to carbs. You know, I keep my high protein diet. You know, of course, the support not to go catabolic at any point, but my body responds to carbs. But for example, Marina, if, if, um, if you respond more to fat, of course, the, the strategy is different. Uh, but for ladies, I don't, I don't necessarily, you know, on your body frame, I don't think you need 15, 20 pounds. I really don't. Uh, because if you're going to gain, let's be realistic. For me, if I can gain five, six pounds a year of lean tissue, that's huge. That's ginormous. I mean, I don't care what people say. I don't care, you know, but if you really want to get shredded and you see some of these big guys and how much they lose, it's insane. So my point is why to gain all that if, you know, 90% is going to be crap and it's going to fall off. Absolutely. I don't know, I know. Just me again. But then, and then again, in the process, a, you're losing muscle too because you're trying yeah, to. And, and I then, know that. It's still hard. And then, you know, and then 
other other topic is you know we're talking about you know big dudes you're like 300 pounds plus and you know to a point i understand what they're doing but then on the other side who's the greatest of all time it wasn't a 300 pound guy it was a guy who was 185 pounds and that's frank zane i mean let, let, let's just face it that's what people remember <laughs> what? i don't know Anyways, yeah, he's a bodybuilder from. So Nick, even this year, so he took a couple of months of an off season before he restarted up his prep. He his weight stayed twenty pounds below what it had in the past, and even yeah. now at this point in time, he is prepping. And I mean, he's eight weeks out, and he's already like six or seven pounds above what we think he will be the last time he stepped on stage, which was a year ago. But he looks better. He's still eating. To, he's still like allowed to eat more on the weekends. Like he feels a lot better. He looks better. Like there's something to be said about staying a lot leaner. Um, yeah, I, I think so. But then also, you know, it's his situation because he's an extremely big guy. I mean, he's, is he the biggest guy out there? I don't know. Probably. <laughs> maybe, maybe second to Remy. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I never, I never met him personally, but based on what I've seen, that's really, really close. So you're talking about few biggest dudes in the world, right? So of course, for him, 20 pounds is what should be two pounds for you. I mean, you know, it, it's just yeah, it has to be proportional. Right. Uh, yeah. But you know, again, um, in my opinion, for bikini, the fluctuation should be much less. Uh, it should be about strategic gains in areas when they need to occur. And I know that happens very slow. It's a painful process. But to me, if it's not strategic, it doesn't have a point. Because if you're going to gain 15 pounds and you're going to multi-compound it, guess what's going to happen? You're going to grow equally everywhere. For example, during deadlift, 95% of all of your muscles participate. Why do you want in those 95% to be muscles that you don't want to enlarge? In your bikini, just let's... Let, let, let's focus on it. You know what's important. So wouldn't you like to strategically, you know, attack certain areas and some to leave out of, um, out of, um, out of the way. So in my opinion, it's not, but then again, many different ways to climb the mountain, a lot of different, you know, a lot of great success stories with people who blew up during, during, uh, off season and then, you know, possibly have to kill themselves, but get there. So a lot, of, I mean, Hey, we've seen, We've seen everything during the course of years. For me, I love my lifestyle. I love how I eat. I love the fact that I can take my shirt off any time during the season and feel really good about it. Um, my sleep is great, you know, and I just personally don't have to fluctuate. My philosophy is not about size. It's all about aesthetics. It's about beauty of a detail. So I, just, I personally and people that I work with, I don't necessarily go there. But again, it's not wrong. There's no wrong here. Um, nice. This is just my story, you know, but there are a lot of other great stories out there, of course. Okay, well, I'll, I'm going to try this uh, reverse <laughs> diet again for the 500 million time to not gain that much, but, you know. But here, but, the, again, but before you started competing, so for me, like, well, before I started competing, I was always small. But like, I was never, or, okay, let me take that back. I'm a mid-sized person. I'm very athletic looking person. I am lean, but I'm not super, super shredded all year round. So for me to reset, like my body's, well, I can't reset my body's fat point. My point, I guess I'm saying, which you concluded to, you always have to be on a diet though. Yes, and, and I would just, you're 100% right. I would just change that word diet well, to more of a lifestyle. Absolutely. And that's what people. So, I so that's accepted. how you stay. Well, you, yes, you lose so. weight, lifestyle person loses weight, but then he needs to uh, adapt to a new lifestyle to yeah. not so, gain so, back. So uh, let me put it to you in very like simple terms how I see it. I don't take anything into my body that I don't have use out of. Okay, so, so Reese's Pieces, I, don't, I can't do anything with them. I don't eat them. So every time, but then far from it, you know, I have my friends and, you know, I'm going to have a relationship and I want to have a normal life just like anyone else. Do I go out? Yeah, absolutely. Do I have a drink every once in a while? As you know, Marina, I do. <laughs> so my point is, if I'm going to have, you know, whatever dinner I want out there, you know, Italian, I'm going to eat pasta. Okay, great. I'll have it. And then strategically, 
I'll put my leg day tomorrow morning. So I will back carb load and I'll get up at five in the morning. And I'm going to go and hit legs hard. If that makes sense. So what about if you as, drink? I mean, if you drink every once in a while with your friends, it's okay. No, you know? but do you train afterwards? Oh, training goes on regardless. Nothing stops I my training. I can't train. It dehydrates me. You don't feel the soreness? Oh, you feel it. So that's why next time don't do it. <laughs> but I always say. <laughs> my bodybuilders don't drink. Yeah, absolutely. I don't uh, drink so when I'm in prep. There's no you, way. If you knew how to party, now you'll know how to do your workout. So there's no, oh, you know, I got too drunk last night. Yeah. Too bad. We're going to do all of our sets and everything else that we set up for today. Uh, so my point is, Summer, just to answer, if you can, or not you, but if someone can have all these things when it's planned versus whenever they feel like it, I think that's how we need to call it. So just this managed eating plan where you can say, okay, this week, you know, I know I can strategically have this on Friday nights instead of having nachos tonight, I'm going to have them on Friday night. That can work. Absolutely. Picking and Because, you know. Obviously, you can be on chicken and rice or whatever, sweet potatoes, every meal, six meals a day, seven meals a day, full year. That's, that's nonsense. You can't. But, again, if, if there is a reason why to have Mexican food for breakfast, probably not. I mean, let's, let's face it. There's no need. It's just maybe something we feel like doing at that moment. Absolutely. But if it doesn't have a purpose, I don't do it. So I'll still go and have my egg whites and oats and whatever we're having. So I, I'm just very disciplined with how I manage those meals. And I think that's the, that's the keyword discipline. Yeah. Yep. Cause you know, there's just no way around it. There's nothing to buy out there. Cook them, bring them with you. That's it. Absolutely. Super simple. Yeah. And manage your date nights out with friends, eating, whatever it is. Yeah. Absolutely. True, true, true. And every restaurant you can have a healthy choice. I remember when we uh, went for dinner after Gabby's win uh, with my friend Paula as well. We, I was in prep. I made healthy choices, and I think you did too. We ordered rice, uh, asparagus, yeah. and steak, and that was it, and it was yeah, okay. Was like that. Mm -hmm. So there's choices everywhere. You can do I, the right choice. Yeah, I did, I did have a drink. I mean, she won qualified with the Olympia, so I had to have a drink, which no, I course. paid for the yes. day. But, yes, but, but course, still, but, you but, didn't eat a burger and fries and drown yourself in alcohol one at the same time. No. You had a little bit. Moderation. Yeah. No. Moderation. Moderation and discipline. Key words. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it will take you a long way. It's, and I know it's much easier said than done, but I, I have this, and, and this my you know, help someone out there. You know, I never, I have one policy with myself. This is, doesn't concern anyone else around me or I didn't promise anyone else. I just promised to myself. But listen to this, that I will never skip a workout. Okay, so if, this week, if I have planned, for example, I'm taking Friday off and every day I'm training and this is my training schedule, never skip a workout. You're too sore, too bad. You're too tired, too bad. You went to bed too late, you watched show, too bad. Oh, I don't feel it today. Oh, it's my feet are wet from the rain. No, you never. You know why? Because first time you do it, there's nothing stopping you to do it the second time. And that keeps on going. Yeah. And then you can create a habit of skipping whenever you don't feel like it. Absolutely. So I never skip a workout. In my whole entire career, I have never skipped the workout that I planned on. And I went sick. And I went, I don't know, because I was like, okay, am I sick? And I'm going to train and be better. Or am I sick and got to get more sick? So it's like, okay, I'll train. I'll do something. You know, maybe it wasn't the greatest workup I've ever done. Maybe I didn't move the weight I wanted, but I did. I showed up. And whatever I had that day, I gave it all. So it, it's been really working for me. And just think about it in that moment. That's really what, what down the road might be the differentiator at that one point. You never know. Because I truly believe. You think all these guys that hit three-pointers in the last second, you think it's luck? I don't think so. I think they just did it so many times, you know, that it became routine for them. Same for us. Yeah. You know, if you train, how, I always say, how you train yourself, that's how you ultimately look. So if you rape the weights, don't expect aesthetics. It's just very, very simple. Same as this. If you never miss, you, it's way more than that workout. Because, you know, all of us here on this call, we can all afford not to train tomorrow, right? You're going to be fine. You're still going to look great. Because let's face it, you're trying to be... 1% of 1%. But for general population, you know, you look like you're from another planet. 
And we all know this. We're just trying to be the best among the best. But by disciplining yourself that you never skip a workout, that you, you know, cook every day, that you do this, it goes a long ways. And I really, really believe, I can't prove this ever, but that could be a differentiator, you know, maybe why I won a pro card or I didn't win a pro card. Why I placed third versus second or maybe I won and I didn't win. And you can't really explain saying, you know what, these two girls look phenomenal too. Why did I win? I don't necessarily see myself better than them, but for some reason, whatever that reason might be, you got a title instead of someone else. And I really think are these little things that we do every day that ultimately make a, a difference out there. Absolutely. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. That really motivate me. And I, I hope it motivates other viewers. So Branko, for a conclusion, tell us what's your goals for 2021. Are you competing this year? Uh, you know, as you know, our being international federation, so all of my shows are abroad very far. I open in Australia in July, on July 11th, but we don't know if it's even going to happen. Uh, our universe show is in Thailand, world's in Bali, so everything so far, these places where they don't I have know. a lot of, I like, I want to go. <laughs> uh, a lot of places where they don't have a lot of vaccinated people, so just, we don't know. So on my end, you know, I'm training for Australia, uh, but, you know, just like last year, you know, we might get canceled here and there. But you know what? It doesn't. To me, July 11th, it's my opener. If it happens, it happens. If it not, I'll just continue to the next one. Again, I don't have to lose 30 pounds to get there, so I'm, I'm not that far out to be yeah. Um, yeah. ready for the stage. Right. Um, as, far yeah. as, um, as far as Marie, uh, we're going to be in Pittsburgh in six weeks. She's going to be ready, uh, and then after that, picking a national show. So our big goal is to make it to the Olympia again, even though we still haven't turned pro, but you know what? So I, she's going to start in July? No, she's starting at Pittsburgh Pro in six weeks, May 1st. No, but the Nationals, she's going to start in July or he's going to start um, in I'm June? Not, I'm not sure. We might pick something like one of the junior shows before that. I don't even know. They used to be in Charleston. Junior in Nats, 18th yeah, of June. Where? In Chattanooga, yeah, Tennessee. Oh, so it's in Tennessee now? Yeah. Okay, and then so, you yeah. have Universe in July, which will be in South Carolina again. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Okay. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Let's see how Pittsburgh goes. Let's I hope what... I get to see you guys. Oh, absolutely. I, I'm sure we will because I'm back to, you know, I still have to earn it again um, to get to where she wants to be. So, yeah, I'm sure we'll, we'll see you in one of those. I'm not sure. I'll keep you posted which way she decides to go. Awesome. But I just want, I just want a sh strong showing in Pittsburgh. I want the panels to see her. Um, and then based on that and see how we fare, we'll, we'll make a next move. That is amazing. Well, great. How can... People reach out to you if they want to compete in your federation or they want to work with you. What is your social media account? Uh, it's simply branco.nyc. Um, as a matter of fact, I will have the, the, the reason I changed from my first and last name is because I will have a matching website that will come out before my trip to South Africa. Um, and then I will have, um, due to the size of my business, I have a few trainers that um, some of the clients are passed on to them just depending on what they're trying to do. So I will have a new scheduling service um, where all the calendar issues are going to be um, done through. So best way right now, DM me through um, branco.nyc and then we just go from there. Okay, Summer, any last words from Branco? I'm ready to train with him. I know. He's, he's from, from my experience, um, it's very unique. Um, it's not anything I ever tried before. Very motivating. I think Branco has this beautiful ability to listen to women that not many men have the patience to. And, um, yeah. And as a trainer myself, and you as a trainer yourself, you know how hard it is sometimes to feel in all those feelings. Cause we are part-time psychologists, part-time social workers to our clients and friends. And we need to be strict. So, I think, I think I can only learn from you and you're very big inspiration for me. I admire your work. I admire you as an athlete as well. And um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. And, you know, when hopefully we'll find uh, some time to train. But Summer, for you, we're here both. So just let me know. I'm, I'm there every day. Are you really? Okay. Um, 100%. What time are you there? We'll talk off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. I'll see you next week, and we will have Branco again sometime soon when he has some update, maybe after his competition. And um, 
my amazing summer will be here back next week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much for having me.